uh, to the book of Hebrews for our opening text that I want to read together. Hebrews chapter 1, and I want to read verses 1 through 4 before we pray. This morning's sermon is uh, a topical sermon. We've been taking a brief break. Uh, we believe that the regular preaching through God's Word consecutively, uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, is the way God has given us His Word and should be the primary diet of the church by way of preaching. But there's also a very important place for topical preaching to hit important subjects that you might not hit if you just make your way through uh, a book of the Bible. And so we want to look this morning at the subject of God's guidance and seeking God's guidance and how we are to do that. And so let us read together the Word of God uh, from the book of Hebrews and read the first opening four verses of this epistle. This is the Word of God, Hebrews chapter 1, beginning in verse 1 and reading through verse 4. And as always, I'm reading from the New King James Version, but I encourage you to follow along in whatever translation of God's Word you have in front of you. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Amen. Let us respond to God's word and go to him before the preaching of his word to ask his help on our time. Let's pray together. Father, we are beggars before your word. We confess that by nature all of our thinking is shrouded in darkness and that we need the gift of your spirit to come and to illuminate to us the truth of your word. Lord, we confess our utter dependence upon the ministry of your spirit in our lives. Lord, we pray that he would come, that he would blow upon his church we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen your people this morning, even as it comes to this subject of guidance, discerning the will of God. We pray, oh, Father, that your word would be understood by us, that it would be obeyed by us. We pray, Father, for those who are not converted, those who are strangers to your grace outside of Christ. We ask, Father, that the Spirit of God might illumine your word to their heart for the first time that they would have the scales, as it were, fall from their eyes, the scales of blindness caused by sin, and that they would see clearly for the first time the glory of Christ, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would be glorified. We ask that all of our hearts would be engaged, all of our minds engaged. As we come to your word with holy reverence, we ask, Father, that we would not treat it lightly, that we would not treat the preaching of your word as something uh, to, to be regarded as a light thing, but that we would come to it recognizing we are hearing from the very word of our creator as we read the scripture. Draw near to us, we pray. Bring glory to yourself, we ask. We ask for your peculiar help by your spirit. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, You've wrestled, no doubt, with the question, how do I find God's will for my life? There's probably a lot of books in Christian bookstores right now with something about that in their title. How do I discover God's guidance on a particular issue, particular decisions? Um, oftentimes, all of us find ourselves at crossroads in life, uh, a fork in the road, as it were, uh, maybe with big events. Should I marry so-and-so? Um, should I take this job? Should we as parents adopt? Uh, what church should I join? Big events like that. But probably even more often you find yourself faced with simply the mundane questions of life like, what should I wear today? Uh, should I accept that lunch invitation next week? Should I volunteer in the nursery at church? Um, as these things present themselves, naturally we ask, is there a way for us to discern the divine will in such situations? Now, virtually all Christians across the board agree 
we ought to seek guidance from God. Uh, he is, after all, our Creator. We heard about that in our Sunday school this morning. He's our Redeemer. He's the one who has promised to be our guide, our leader. However, the discussion of exactly how we are to seek guidance from God is the discussion that is wildly confused in our day. Uh, guidance today is much like what you read over and over in the book of Judges, that everyone does what is right in their own eyes. Um, and the average Christian gets tossed to and fro uh, in this sea of frustration. And more than that, not only frustration, but a sea of paralyzing anxiety at times. Uh, let me just, to, to orient you to what I'm talking about, mention just a few of the popular, yet I'm convinced unbiblical ways that Christians often seek guidance in our day. Uh, and indeed, some of these methods have become so much ingrained into how Christians think about guidance that for me even to challenge them is in the minds of some to question whether I even believe in the ministry of the Holy Spirit at all. Uh, so I know I'll step on some toes here this morning. That's okay. You can talk to me afterward. We'll have a friendly conversation about these things and we can go deeper. Let me just mention a few things that are very prevalent and common in our day. The first one is what I'm calling listening to that, for, or excuse me, listening for that still small voice. Right? And that's something that's taken out of context from Elijah's experience in the Old Testament that he heard a still small voice. Uh, one is taught to wait patiently, sometimes even encouraged to empty their minds, not to think too much, until they discern a clear impression or a word from the Lord. And a major problem with this, of course, is that it's often impossible for us to know for certain the difference between God's guidance and our own desires. Or even worse, desires that might be influenced by Satan himself. Uh, we could extend this category to include other forms of communication like dreams, uh, people receiving visions of sorts. Uh, and quite frankly, this is something that many Christians would give the impression is a regular part of their Christian life. A second thing that is prevalent in our day of seeking guidance is what's called putting out a fleece. And again, you, you're familiar with the story of Gideon probably in the Old Testament. Putting out a fleece to test God for guidance. Um, it's essentially a way of uh, calling God to give an external sign for us, to tell us which way we should go. And this can be as subtle as praying that, God, if you would just cause a certain thing to happen, then I will know your direction. Something like, God, if, I get, if when I get home my wife tells me that we received a bill in the mail today, then I'll know that that's a sign that we need more money and it's a sign that I should take that new job. Um, I even remember someone telling me once that they prayed for God to show them a sign that Jesus is real. And they subsequently walked outside and they immediately laid eyes on a telephone pole, which in their minds resembled a cross. And they thought that that was something very significant, that God was proving himself to them. Um, a third way, a third form of guidance that's prevalent in our day is that guidance that we're told often will come to us from God giving a word to others for us about our situation, um, what we might call modern-day prophecy. Um, I remember our, our, our recently departed brother, R.C. Sproul, recounting a time in his own life when he had a major decision before him and he had to go one way or the other, and he had two different people on two different occasions come to him and tell him, R.C., I've received a word of the Lord on the way you are to go in this situation. And they were flat out contradictory. <laughs> now that's a problem. If God is giving words to different people that are contradictory, that's a problem for our, for our doctrine of God, our doctrine of his truthfulness. Now, th those are just a few ways. We, we can multiply examples. Many of you in this room are familiar with them. Perhaps uh, use them in your own life. Uh, those are just a few ways that oftentimes Christians can be confused in our day. But also coupled with this is an anxiety uh, that because many, many Christians have been taught this concept of God's having a great plan for their life, uh, they live in an almost paralyzed state to ever do anything because they're afraid that if they ever take a wrong turn in their life, if they ever make an unwise decision, if they ever go right when God actually wanted them to go left, they're afraid and anxious that they're going to somehow step outside and miss God's plan for their life. That they're going to somehow fall out of God's will and consign themselves to a life of lousy second bests. And it often paralyzes Christians, this kind of thinking about the will of God. Uh, it paralyzes Christians from ever making decisions about anything because they're just so deathly afraid of missing God's plan for them. And this obviously misses the implications of God's sovereignty over our lives, including our sins, including our foolish decisions, that he is able to turn them for his own glory and, his, and our good. 
I want to try to help you practically this morning sort through this subject a bit. And I submit to you this morning that the Bible's teaching on this subject is far more straightforward than many Christians believe it is in our day. It's far less mystical than many Christians would have us to think. Uh, and I can't this morning in the time that we have, and I don't pretend to answer every objection, every question, every eventuality this morning. We can talk about those things more later. Uh, but I do want to point you in a biblical direction and get you started on a biblical traje uh, trajectory to start thinking about this subject of guidance according to God's Word. And it, you can see on the back of your, uh, your bulletin this morning that I have just four uh, simple, straightforward points. That's kind of going to be the way that we're going to tackle this this, this morning. And like I said, this is a topical sermon. It's not going to be an, a, a deep exposition of any text, not Hebrews 1 or any of the others that we'll touch on. Uh, but I would encourage you, I've, I put some of the scripture references there for you. I'm not going to be waiting just for time's sake to, for everyone to turn to all these texts. I'm going to be uh, speaking them to you from my notes. And so you can kind of get ahead of me if you want, if, you, if we're going there next, so that you can see these things in your own Bibles. Uh, but this is where we're going, these four points. First of all, I want us to see very clearly, point number one, that God promises to lead us. God does promise to be our guide. This is the first thing that we must settle. Uh, we must settle it that God himself, since the beginning of the creation of the earth, has called himself and identified himself as the leader and the guide of his people. And the reason that that's very important to, to, to determine from the outset is that if this were not so, if God has not promised that he will guide us, then our search for divine guidance might be in vain. It might be a fool's errand at best. But we find very clearly all throughout the scriptures that God himself is the one who guides his people. Psalm 31, verse 3, the psalmist says, For you are my rock and my fortress, therefore for your name's sake lead me and guide me. Uh, Psalm 48, verse 14, For this is God, our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even to death, the psalmist said. So not only does God guide sometimes, but He even promises all the time to guide His people even to their own death, the point of their, the end of their life. Revelation 7, verse 17, uh, For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And we could multiply texts. This is, I, I encourage you, if you just type in your, uh, your Bible search tool, guide, uh, lead, words like that, you'll find these come up all over the place, Old Testament and New Testament. But God is our guiding God, and we should be thankful for that. We should rejoice in that. But that raises the million-dollar question, doesn't it? How does God guide us? Or better worded, the question, to word the question more precisely, not just how does God guide us, but how has God promised to guide us? You see, this is where I think many Christians in our day have taken a wrong turn. And even as our brother uh, Mel was opening up a bit about hermeneutics and how to understand your Bible properly, uh, this is by and large the result of bad principles of Bible interpretation. Uh, you see, many Christians make the wrong assumption that because God has, in the past, guided His people in certain ways, then that must mean that He will also do that for us in every age. But that's not a sound principle of biblical interpretation. Uh, no one is disputing that God has employed throughout the ages many different ways of guiding His people. Uh, think about the Israelites. He guided the people of Israel uh, with a physical pillar of fire and a cloud. Uh, he guided Balaam by speaking to him through his donkey. He guided others by the casting of the lot at times. We see that often in the Old Testament. Uh, but simply because God has acted one way with some people in the past is not a promise that he will always act that way with all his people at all times. And in fact, if you want a, a, a text that proves that, it's the text that we opened up with this morning in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke to us in the times past by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us in His Son. And you see the contrast there, don't you? Various ways, many ways God has spoken to us in the past, but in these last days He has spoken to us supremely in the person of His Son. And so the question for us this morning when we come to this subject is not how can or how has God guided His people in the past, but how has God promised to guide us? as New Testament, New Covenant Christians? And the biblical answer to that is, I think, two primary ways. And I've got them here in your notes, uh, in your outline. Providence and Scripture. 
God has promised to guide us in providence, in his sovereign providence, as our lives unfold, as well as in Scripture. First of all, providence. Simply what I mean by drawing this to our attention is that God is the sovereign maker and ruler of the whole universe. Uh, this is the most basic of theological truths. That God is not the divine watchmaker uh, who just created the earth, he wound it up like a big watch, and then he kind of just left it be and let it to unwind on its own. No. God is the one who is ultimately and intimately, down to the very atoms and molecules, directing everything whatsoever comes to pass in this world for His glory and His own good purposes and the good of His people. From the creation to the end of the world, God is the guiding God who is guiding every single event down to the minutest of details for His own glory and the good of His people. And obviously, if God controls the whole universe, he obviously controls every single event that happens to you in your individual life. And of course, one text that we could, we could hang this on, a, a great text that teaches us is Romans 8.28, isn't it? Uh, a text that we're all very familiar with. Paul says, for we know, we, we are confident of this, that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. God is working all things in your life including your obedience, even including your sin, including your good decisions, your bad decisions, your indecisiveness, you name it. God is orchestrating and bringing all of it under the, His control to conform you to Christ and to bring, it, to bring glory to Himself. That's a, that's, that has massive implications for us as Christians. If what I've just said is true, if that's an accurate interpretation of what Paul is saying in Romans 8, and we could go to many other places to open this up, then in this sense, it is impossible for you to ever be outside the will of God. Have you ever thought about that? That God has a sovereign will, that it is impossible for anything or anyone to ever take a step outside of. No, there's no place that you can find yourself. No matter how many terrible choices you've made, no matter how great your sins are, in which you cannot confidently say in Christ, God, for His inscrutably good purposes, willed all of this to come to pass for my good and His glory. So that's one way that God guides us, is providentially, sovereignly, behind the scenes. Every, every stitch that goes into the tapestry of our lives, God is purposed and is bringing to pass to guide us to where He is taking us. But there's another way in which we speak of God's guidance, and that's what we could call, if you want the technical term, special revelation, but I'm just calling it, for simplicity's sake, Scripture. Scripture, His Word to us. Um, while we are promised in the Bible that God is guiding us behind the scenes, if you will, in His sovereign providence, He also promises to guide us directly by His Word, by His spoken Word to us. As Hebrews 1 says, God has revealed His Word to His people in various times and in various ways. In particular, I mean, you, you can think about even what that means and what the, the author to the Hebrews maybe was thinking in his own mind. Think about the Ten Commandments. Our brother Mel brought it out this morning. God wrote by His own finger on the stone the ten words. Uh, he delivered His word to Moses in the burning bush. That's another method He used. Uh, he delivered His word at large to the people through the prophets. But ultimately, He commits His word to writing, which we call the Scripture, our Bible. Um, and that serves as the guide of His people. Just listen, uh, or if you're already there, you can read along with me. Psalm 19, verses 7 through 13. I'm just picking certain, certain verses out here. The testimony of the Lord, that's the word of the Lord, is sure, making wise the simple. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than they are gold, yea, much, more, uh, much fine gold. And that says something, I think, to, to about many modern Christians who are more eager to put their Bible on the shelf and seek inward impressions than they are actually to value the Word of God as honeycomb and as gold. He goes over, he says, Moreover, uh, he goes on, Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Psalm 9, uh, 119, verse 24, Your testimonies are my delight and my counselors. You see that? So if you want counsel as a Christian, the psalmist says, turn to God's testimonies. Turn to God's word. Uh, Psalm 1, a very well-known passage of Scripture. Who is the man who is blessed and is unmoved, uh, even as a tree planted by streams of living water who bears his fruit in its season? 
It's the man whose meditation is on the law of God day and night. Right? God guides his people through the word he has spoken to them and which has been written down in scripture for all the ages. And so, if, simply put, if we want to hear God speak, we need to read the Bible. If we want to hear God speak audibly, we need to read the Bible out loud, right? This is where we hear God's word. And so many Christians, I fear in our day, are so busy listening for inner impressions and inner words from God that they miss the tone that God has given us of his word in his Bible. Okay, that brings us to the second thing I want us to, to consider just briefly. It's a, it's a shorter point, asking the wrong question. Asking the wrong question, that's something of an introduction of how God has promised to guide his people. Uh, we need to say something about oftentimes how we ask the wrong question. At this point, given what I've just told you, some of you probably are thinking, okay, so you're pointing me to my Bible. That's what you're doing. You're, you're pointing me to look to my Bible and read my Bible. Okay, that's great. But I've got a decision on whether I need to take that job in New York next week. Um, uh, whether I should undergo this surgery, uh, etc. And I know, you're saying, there's no verse in this book that's going to tell me whether I should do that or not. Um, and, and, by the way, wouldn't we love, wouldn't we wish guidance were like that? <laughs> All of us want guidance to be like that. Because that would make life easy. Um, God, you know, God, just give me a textbook of all the potential eventualities of what could ever possibly come into my life, whatever crossroads I might ever find myself in, tell me what to do and I'll do it. <laughs> and we like that because it eliminates the need for wisdom, doesn't it? It eliminates the need for hard thinking over God's word and fundamentally it would remove our need even for God himself. Because then all we would need is a book and we can give the right answers. But I submit to you this morning, along these lines of asking the wrong questions, if that's you, if, that, if that's what you're thinking right now, you might be asking the wrong questions of God regarding guidance. By and large, in our day, our agonizing questions of guidance usually revolve around the very self-centered things that will bring us the most comfort and the most prosperity. Um, and we focus and agonize over things that we think are very important, we're convinced are very important, when in God's eyes they're actually very unimportant. Whereas the question of guidance we see the saints in the Bible wrestling with, and, and we could even add to that in more, I think, biblically literate generations, uh, generations gone by, the questions of guidance they were wrestling with were far more God-centered, not man-centered. They were asking questions like this, what will bring most glory to God? What will serve most my sanctification? Uh, what will give most opportunity to love and to do good to my fellow image bearers? You see the difference between those two things? I think when we reframe the question, instantly a thousand questions for us already get answered. They answer themselves. You see, we often want to know exactly what God has in store for us, our lives. God, what have you planned for us? As if we were the center of God's universe, when the more biblical question for us to ask is, how do I fit in with what God is doing for himself in the world? Um, and that really reframes for us. It's a humbling thing that reframes for us what's important, doesn't it? What is God about in the world? What is God doing in the world? Well, I can tell you this, he's not in the business of giving Kyle Fitzgerald everything he ever desired in this life. That's not what God is about. Rather, what he is about is he's about saving a people for himself from sin by his spirit, causing them to trust Christ for salvation, bringing them to glory, sanctifying them, conforming them into the image of his son so that in eternity, in heaven, heaven will be filled with countless perfect image bearers of the Lord Jesus for the glory of God. That's what God is doing in the world, and that's where God is guiding his people. That's what he's told us. That's where we're going. Read the book of Revelation. That's what's going to happen, the new heavens and the new earth. And so it reframes for us, doesn't it, in the here and now, the questions we ask about guidance. All of our desires for guidance need to fit in with that bigger framework of what God is doing in his word and in history. Now, there's a key thing we need to understand, especially in our day, with regards to this whole subject, and it's probably something that many of you wrestle through, have thought through, perhaps even as I've been preaching this, you've been wondering, is he going to hit on this? And so I want to focus and spend a bit of time on our third point this morning, the ministry of the Spirit of God in guidance. Um, and you can see that that's your third point here, and I put a couple main passages that we're going to consider. The ministry of the Spirit in guidance. You cannot talk about 
guidance without talking about the Spirit's ministry in our lives. And I'm just going to nail my colors to the mast here, and many of you know this about me already. I think the Spirit of God and His work in redemption is the most understood person in the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is a person in the Trinity. Uh, he is all over the Bible called He. He's not called it. He can be grieved, Ephesians 4.30. He can be lied to, according to Acts 5. The Holy Spirit, this is a helpful way for us to think about him. The Holy Spirit is just as much a person, just as much a leader, just as much a teacher as was the Lord Jesus when he was physically present with his apostles upon the earth. Indeed, that's why the Lord Jesus, if you read the Upper Room Discourse, that's why the Lord Jesus is encouraging his disciples, it's actually good for you if I go, if I depart and go into heaven, because then I'm going to send the Helper. I'm going to send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. Now, why is that important for me to stress? I stress that from the outset because as tragic as it is, the Holy Spirit in our day is treated more like an impersonal, mystical force or feeling then he is the divine third person of the God of heaven, which is very, very, very far off base, biblically speaking. What is the ministry of the Spirit, biblically speaking? What does it mean to be a Spirit-led person? Uh, it's a very important question for us to ask this morning. And I'm convinced there's been a great divorce uh, in, in, the, in the church today between the Spirit of God and the Word of God. A, do, a divorce, a separation of the Spirit of God from the Word of God. The Spirit's guiding and teaching ministry is inextricably bound up with the Word of God. And there's two aspects of that. If you want to, you know, if you open up your systematic theology, this is what you're going to find them talking about. First of all, the inspiration of the Word of God, the Spirit inspiring the writing of the Scriptures, and then the illumination of the Word that He has written to His people. I want to invite you to turn to John 16, if you're not already there, uh, and just look briefly at three, uh, these four verses that the Lord Jesus um, gives his disciples. Remember, John 16 is right in the middle of the upper room discourse. Uh, Jesus is speaking to the eleven. Judas has already gone out at this point. Um, this is the night of his betrayal, and he's promising them that the Comforter will come. Uh, Jesus himself is physically going to, 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 uh, excuse me, to depart from them for the first time, but he and his Father, he promises, are going to come to them and make their abode with them in the person of the Spirit. Now notice, very importantly, what Jesus says this Comforter, the Holy Spirit, will do. John 16, look at verse 12. Jesus says to them, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. In other words, Jesus is right at the end of his ministry. He's about to be arrested. He's about to be taken. And he has a, his teaching ministry to them is not over. He has a lot to say to them, but they can't bear it now. And so that's where verse 13 comes in. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Notice what the spirit's called there, the spirit of truth. It says that he will guide you into all truth. You could flip over a couple or one chapter in John 17, verse 17, of the Lord Jesus' high priestly prayer. He says, Your word is truth. In other words, this is a promise Jesus is giving to his apostles of inspiration, the inspiration of the Spirit. And sometimes you hear Christians use that term loosely and they say things like, Well, you know, I just really felt that the Spirit inspired me to write this, this poem, maybe. I, I felt the, the Spirit inspired me to write this letter. The Spirit is not inspiring anymore. If the Spirit did inspire you to write something, then we need to tack it right onto the end of our Bibles because that makes it revelation <laughs> and that makes it authoritative. And we need to be careful about how we talk about these things. The Spirit is not inspiring anymore. Uh, this is essentially the unique promise of their apostolic witness and the subsequent writing of our New Testament. This is not a promise Jesus is giving to the whole church. Uh, sometimes you hear it used that way, that this is Jesus' promise to me that I can understand my Bible. There are other passages we could go to to prove that. That is true. Uh, but we shouldn't go here for that because this is a unique promise to the eleven that they will be the unique instruments, the apostles, to found the church on the revelation of the Word of Christ. And what person of the Trinity is going to do it? Jesus says it is the Spirit of God. You see already how the Spirit is intricately bound up with the writing of the Word of God. Jesus goes on, he says, For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Verse 14, He will glorify me, 
That's massively theologically important for us. Notice that. That's what the Spirit does. The Spirit does not give feelings. The Spirit does not uh, give mystical experiences. He reveals and glorifies Christ. Right? Just as the Son of Man, think about it, just as the Son of God came into the world to honor and glorify His Father, so now also the Spirit has come and takes upon Himself the role of glorifying the Son. He says, Jesus goes on, For He will take of what is mine and declare it to you. He says, All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that He will take of mine and declare it to you. So you see, the ministry of the Spirit, first of all, is to reveal and glorify Christ. Uh, uh, fulfilled initially in their apostolic preaching and witness, and subsequently in the committing of that witness to the body of writings we call the Scripture. But the Spirit doesn't only inspire the Word of God. This is where we need to go further. He not only inspires the Word of God to be written, but He also illuminates the hearts and minds of His people to understand the Word of God that He has inspired. I invite you to turn with me now to 1 Corinthians 2, uh, verses 10 through 16. 1 Corinthians 2. Uh, inspiration is a unique gift God gave to His uh, apostles, but illumination is something that happens to every Christian. It's, indeed, it must happen if we are to embrace Christ savingly. And we're probably familiar with 1 Corinthians, some of us. Um, Paul is contrasting, especially in the opening chapters of this epistle, he's contrasting the wisdom of God with the wisdom of men. And he's contrasting that which is spiritually discerned with that which is the wisdom of the world. Uh, and in chapter 2, Paul's explaining why to some, his preaching, his apostolic word, he's explaining why to some, when they hear that, it's viewed as foolishness, it's viewed as a stumbling block, and yet to others it becomes the wisdom of God and the power of God. Look at what Paul writes. Very, very key passage of Scripture for us to understand here. 1 Corinthians 2, beginning in verse 10. Paul says, but, but, uh, excuse me, but God has revealed them. And he's referring there, you can see in the context, clearly to the things of his preaching. God has revealed them to us, how? Through his Spirit. You see that? That's, a, that's illumination. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man, he's using an analogy here, what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except for the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. And what's the result? That we might know the things that we have been freely given to us by God. Mark that. What does receiving the Spirit of God do for the believer? It causes them to know cognitively, with their understanding, the things that have been given to them in the message of God as preached by the apostles in their case or as received in the scriptures by, our, by us. Paul goes on in verse 13. He says, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual, that is, has the Spirit, judges all things. Yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. And then notice this closing statement in verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You see that. You see what Paul is opening up here. To possess the Spirit is to possess the mind of Christ. And how do we possess the mind of Christ? It is by the Spirit of God illumin illuminating our hearts and minds to embrace and know the things which are proclaimed to us in the apostolic message. Now you might be asking yourself, well, okay, what does that have to do with guidance? <laughs> Why are we getting a systematic theology lesson on inspiration and illumination? And those are words that you can impress your friends with, by the way. But what does it have to do with guidance? My answer is it has everything to do with guidance. Absolutely everything. Because this says, if you embrace what I've just told you, it says that to be filled and led by the Spirit is to be indwelt by Him to understand and obey the Word of Christ. Let me say that one more time. To be filled and led by the Spirit is to be indwelt by Him to understand and obey the Word of Christ that He has inspired. Which for us today, guess what? is the very Bible that you're holding in your lap. We don't have apostles running around in our day. God is not giving fresh revelation. Being led by the Spirit is knowing the Christ of this book. 
It is knowing the God of whom it speaks and what it requires of us. Uh, to be led by the Spirit is to study deeply the things that God has revealed to us of Christian character, wisdom, righteousness, ethics. Uh, this is why we see, just to give you a few uh, examples of even how we see Paul himself tying these two things together, the Spirit and the Word, we see in Ephesians 5, and, and you might be aware the book of Ephesians and the book of Colossians have much that overlap in their content. Um, they very much run parallel to each other. Paul says in Ephesians 5.18, he commands the church, he says, Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. But in the parallel passage in Colossians, Colossians 3 verse 16, he doesn't say be filled with the Spirit being filled with, or speaking to one another hymns and spiritual songs. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. In other words, in Paul's theology, to be filled with the Spirit is to be filled with the Word of Christ. Or again, we see in Ephesians 6, verse 17, Paul commands the church to uh, take the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. Right? The way we offensively, right? that's what a sword is, it's for offense. Uh, if we, the way we offensively live our lives for the glory of God and in the power of the Spirit is to know the Word that He has inspired for us. Or think of our supreme example, the Lord Jesus Himself. Right? The one who we could go to John 3 and see that He's the one whom the Father has given the Spirit without measure. Christ had the Spirit without measure. And in the beginning of his earthly ministry, when the Spirit of God leads the Lord Jesus into temptation in the wilderness, what do we find? He is a man who is filled to the brim with the Word of God. It is written, saying to the, to the devil, it is written, it is written. That's what the Spirit-led life is. And the Lord Jesus is our primary example. To be filled with the Spirit is to be filled with His Word, that we might live in a way that's pleasing to God. So, bringing it down to, a, to a, a practical level, just because I know this is what we're all asking. Okay, so how do I decide what to do about that job? Well, how do I know whether I should take that job in such and such a city? Well, it's not by getting a certain feeling. It's not by getting a certain impression. It's by knowing what this book says and asking questions like this. How does this decision fit in with the priorities God has given me in His Word as a Christian? Uh, does it cause me, does this decision cause me to disobey anything God has said in His, in His Word? If it does, guess what? You already have your answer straight away. You can't do it because it's outside the will of God. Asking questions like, will it hinder anything God has commanded me to order my life around? Uh, will it unwisely remove me or distance me from a healthy church? Those are the things that we are thinking through and asking as it comes to guidance. Now, I'm, I'm perfectly aware. Some, some hear that, and perhaps there's some here this morning. You hear that, and your immediate response is just to say, that, that's not spiritual. It doesn't sound spiritual. And I would say this. If, you're, if your notion of spirituality is more like the pagan notion of spirituality, of being mystically and mindlessly led, then you're right, it's not spiritual. But if by spiritual we mean growing deeper in our understanding and love for Christ, as He's revealed in His Word, as given us by the Spirit, who Jesus said that's what He would do, He would glorify Him, and so that we live obedient lives for His glory, that is the essence of spirituality walking according to His Word to us. Let me close with our fourth point here and just ask a practical question. What aids has God given us to understand His guidance? And again, I know that there's a lot of things that probably stones that we'd like to turn over and we just don't have time for this morning. We can talk about those things, uh, Lord willing. Um, but let us close here with this last point that I just want to give you some practical guidance on what this looks like of being uh, Spirit-led people, meaning indwelt by the Spirit to understand and walk according to His Word. What aids, number, number four, what aids has God given us to understand His guidance? Briefly, I want to just close by giving you practical aids here of helping us growing in what it looks like to understand and apply God's Word to our lives. It would be wrong if someone went away from here this morning thinking, well, I guess seeking God's guidance is merely a matter of private Bible study and seeking the Spirit's help. Uh, we are desperately dependent upon the Spirit's ministry and illumination. That's true. We need the Spirit. Without the Spirit, we will not understand His Word. But that does not mean that we're alone in understanding the Scriptures and applying them to our lives. And in seeking guidance, in seeking to understand and grow in our understanding and knowledge of God's Word, 
God has given us many, many aids. And I want to give you three, uh, just to point you in the right direction here. First of all, God has given us teachers. God has given us teachers. Uh, Some have wrongly applied Jesus' word when he says to the disciples uh, that I will give you my spirit who will lead you into all truth. Sometimes you hear that wrongly applied by Christians as some sort of proof text that, see, I don't need any human teachers. Uh, Jesus promised that I would have a spirit. He'll lead me into all truth. I don't need books. I don't need teachers. I don't need anyone else. That's a damaging and prideful mistake to make. The ministry of the Spirit ought never to be pitted against the use of human means like teachers. Uh, Think of Acts 8, verse 31, right? You know the context of Acts 8. Uh, The Ethiopian eunuch is sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, and what's going on? He's confused. He doesn't understand what he's reading. And so Philip runs over to him and asks him, do you understand the things that you are reading? To which he responds, how can I unless someone guides me. None of us, brothers and sisters, are above the need of help to understand and apply the scriptures to our lives. Seek those. This is is an encouragement to you. Seek those wiser than you. Seek those who know their Bible more deeply than you, who can help you to point you to principles and things in the scriptures that you've never even begun to think about. And they will help you understand and apply God's word rightly. The second practical aid that God has given us in understanding his guidance is the church. Uh, And this is obviously very much related to to God giving us teachers. We need other people. But I wanted to make this point explicit uh, because it's very important for us to understand. God has given us the church to help us understand his word. And that means many things. One thing it means is that it means your local church, which is why every Christian ought to be joined to a healthy Bible-believing local church in membership. But it also means the church, even as it transcends time and space across the globe, God by His Spirit, I don't know if we think about this as we ought to, God by His Spirit has been giving light to His church for 2,000 years to better and more precisely understand and proclaim His Word. Each generation building on the light of the previous generation. And we are both foolish and arrogant if we cast that off and say that we want nothing to do with that. And there's a spirit in the church in our day, by and large, in which there is a suspicion and an apathy towards the labors of previous generations of Christians. As though we with our Bibles and the Holy Spirit are wiser than all the collective wisdom that the Spirit has given the church of all the generations that have gone before us. You know, this is why we as your elders and us who are members here at Bethany, we believe in, in identifying ourselves with the historic confessions of the church. Right? Some people think we're outdated. You know, you hold to something that was written in 1689. It wasn't actually written in 1689. Uh, but part of the point of that is it identifies historically the streams of true Christian confession. And it's not something that we just made up on our own. But we trust in the w- wisdom of the collective body of the church. Don't despise the church. Don't despise how God the Spirit has given light to the church. Now, is the church infallible? No. Has the church erred? Yes. But that does not mean that we should not receive with thankfulness the wisdom and the spiritual light that the church has received in ages past. Finally, the third uh, practical aid God has given us to understand His guidance and His will is prayer. Prayer. Spurgeon tells the story of a certain Puritan who was engaged in a heated theological debate. It was a very, very rigorous debate. And his friends surrounded him, and they watched this Puritan man as he was at his desk writing frantically on a piece of paper while his opponent was giving his defense and his position. Um, And his friends thought, certainly, he's taking notes on his opposition. Certainly, he's uh, writing down points for his own defense when he gets up. But as he got up and his friends stooped over and looked at the paper that was on the desk, afterwards all they found was a piece of paper with these words written over and over on it. More light, Lord. More light. More light, Lord. More light. That's a good lesson for us. He was praying for the illumination of the Spirit of God to understand the Scriptures. And so also we need to pray. 
However, we need to be clear here. There's something we, we, we need to uh, suss out the details here. When we pray to God for light, when we pray for guidance by the Spirit, we're not praying, or at least we shouldn't be praying, for some sort of new revelation that comes to us outside the Scriptures, like a sign or a feeling. Rather, when we pray for light, the way this man was, we're praying for a better understanding of our own circumstances according to the Word of God and a fuller, deeper understanding of God's Word that we might apply it more helpfully and faithfully to our lives. We need prayer. Well, in conclusion, how do we know God's will for our lives? It's simple. Know the word that he has spoken, obey it, and do what you want. God's will is that you know him through this book, what he requires of you, and live your life according to it. And it's true. All of us know it's true that our future remains a mystery to all of us. None, none of us in this room knows what's going, coming for us tomorrow in God's sovereign providence. But we do know that he has spoken clearly and given us everything we need to be equipped to walk through it in a way that is pleasing to him and that brings glory to him. God has not given us a map of all the things that will take place in our future. Rather, he has given us a compass in his word by which we can find our way in a way that's pleasing to him. And you know, uh, contrary to what we're often told, there is a freedom, or, or, or we're often told that there is a freedom in the mystical leadings of the Spirit. When you're just waiting for signs, you're waiting for impressions. But many of you know by experience that's actually bondage because it entraps you in a never-ending cycle of unclear, confused guides. But there is freedom in the simplicity of understanding God's Word because He's not the God of confusion. His Word is not contradictory. It's not veiled in mystery. It is clear. And more than that, it is trustworthy. And we can build our lives upon it. May God help us this morning as we live our lives to know His Word, to obey His Word, and to follow Him, our trustworthy guide. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank You that You are our guiding God. Lord, there are so many things left unsaid, so many stones left unturned uh, that would no doubt be helpful for us to consider. Lord, we do ask that you would write by your Spirit, the Spirit whom we have been talking about, uh, that he would illumine our hearts and our minds to understand the things that have been given to us in your Word. Lord, we pray that you would make us those who live our lives in such a way that magnifies and glorifies your trustworthy Word. Lord, we pray that you would deliver us. We also pray, Lord, for the health of your church, seeing as this is um, such a large movement in our day of many being led astray. We pray that you would cause Christians to be less interested in new revelations, new signs, new impressions, and that they would not neglect, but that they would study diligently your clear word that you have given to us once for all, as has been handed down to the saints. Father, we pray for your help in this. We pray, Lord, that you might help us to know your word better, that when we are faced with the very complex situations of life, that we would be those who understand and have a, a grip on your word. Lord, that you would mature us so that we might, when we come to the crossroads of decisions, we might be thinking God-centered thoughts, God-centered questions about your glory, about our own sanctification, about uh, how much opportunity this decision will give me to love others practically as you've commanded us. Lord, we pray that you would be working in us in these ways, um, that you would deliver us even from the self-centeredness of so, so many of our questions, Lord, and I confess that myself of even being so wrapped up in the, the minute details of our own lives that we miss the bigger picture of what you're concerned with in the world. Father, draw near to us. Help us by your Spirit, we pray. We ask now that you would go with us into this week. We thank you for the Lord's Day. Thank you for the blessing of gathering with your people uh, on this one day in seven that you've given us. And we do pray that you would help us to be those who faithfully live our lives for your glory. May we be those who repent of our sins when we fall short of your glory. May we confess them. And may we turn again in the way of righteousness and trust wholeheartedly in the mercies and the love of Christ, that he has both justified us in your sight and also he has given us your spirit and changed us definitively from darkness to light, that we might in the power of your spirit obey your word for his glory. Father, draw near to us, we pray. Bless your people and be honored in our lives, we ask. We ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen.